talk, I'll present uh, some of the things that I've been working on for the past year or two, maybe going back to some of the earliest days of modular forms, some of their earliest incarnations and combinatorial examples, and I'll try to convince and motivate and present results that show that actually there's still quite a bit of fertile ground even in some of these oldest threads uh, that's still very relevant today. So to my great surprise, uh, contrary to many meetings at which I speak, uh, there's been very little discussion of partitions. Uh, thanks, Scott, uh, for doing a little of my work. But anyway, integer partitions, Euler's partitions, some basic notation for the partitions of n. Here's an example of the partitions of five. There are seven of them. Here are two of them singled out in blue, one of them singled out in red. I'll tell you why in a moment. So one of the earliest truly interesting examples and, and results in the theory of partitions that actually had uh, deep ramifications throughout a, a number of different areas are the rogers ramanujan identities, which we have already seen in some incarnations mentioned in this conference. So I'll start with a, a combinatorial perspective. So bit of partition notation, I'll, I'll read the first line in words. So B1 of N is the partitions of N whose successive parts all differ by at least two. C1 is those where the, there are no ones. So here are those two partitions in blue. The parts differ by at least two. And the five is in red, has no one. So these are the counts for B1 of 5, C1 of 5. Yet another definition, the partitions, all of whose parts are plus or minus R mod K. Again, we give a simple definition for 5, 1. So if all the parts are plus or minus 1 mod 5, then all you can use is 4s and 1s. There are these two partitions, again in blue, and one partition whose parts are plus or minus two mod five of size five, another red one. And this is not a coincidence. In fact, it's a, a very happy, well, or perhaps it is a coincidence, but a very happy one. And it continues to hold for all n that this is the combinatorial statement of the rogers ramanujan identities that the partitions of N, all of whose parts differ by at least two, are equinumerous with the partitions of N, all of whose parts are plus or minus one mod five, and similarly for the second one. So a very striking identity. If you are happier with Q series and things that look like functions or generating functions, as many, perhaps most of us in this room are. Here's an analytic version of the same statement. So this sum, hypergeometric sum on the left is actually the generating function for the two combinatorial definitions. If R is one, I should have mentioned this. If R is one, then that's the generating function for the B1. If R is two, it's for the, the C1. And it equals an infinite product for those partitions whose parts are in the designated residue classes. So the shorthand on the right, these standard Q factorials, which have come up a couple of times, but I'll just refresh the definition in case you're not so comfortable with this. And the, the bottom bit, actually, if you have the same base 
So this q to the fifth, then I'll use the shorthand. But so the, as I said, the Rogers Ramanujan identities have been highly influential in the, I don't remember if I, yeah, I included the year. So in the nearly century, the near century since they were well, first published, I, I suppose they occurred earlier than that in Rogers' work, where they were somewhat hidden and lost and until they were found when Ramanujan independently proved, uh, proved them. But they have inspired subsequent work and generalizations in the combinatorial and analytic theory of integer partitions with some vast generalizations due to Andrews, Gordon. Uh, I'm not going to read all the names on this slide. This is basically a slide full of names. There, you can go to Matt Sinet, and there are literally hundreds of papers on the topic or building on and, and on the extent the extension of Rogers or Monogen and their ramifications. So their applications and results in the theory of hypergeometric Q series uh, from a, a founded analytic point of view. So, and, and also Q continued fractions, which I'll show you on in, in a bit. Uh, these have had great importance in the theory of affine Lie algebras and the vertex operator algebra program of Lepowski and Wilson and others in the area. Uh, these are fairly simple and meaningful examples of modular functions, uh, that, that product form, which also give you access to the full strength of all the tools of modular forms and functions that we have been talking about and thus far in this conference. So algebraic formulas and identities, relationships, analytic formulas such as asymptotics for the coefficients or the behavior towards cusps, um, maybe a striking recent result due to uh, Griffin, Ono, and Warnar uh, with algebraic formulas of a, a similar flavor to what Scott spoke of for the partition function and smallest parts partition function. Well, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe not. Let me not try to further clarify that statement. I'll move on. So I said that there is modularity. These are modular functions. Let me write that a little more specifically, a little more precisely. So the eta function again, here's one normalization of Jacobi's theta function and the ensuing Jacobi triple product. But feel free to send your q's to q squareds and your z's to minus z's or z q's uh, as you please. So for any, uh, written this way, for, for any rational A, the theory of uh, Ziegel's theory, early theory of modular functions, i.e. weight zero meromorphic modular forms, implies that this quotient is modular with the attached necessary rational Q power. So in this notation, here are, here's the analytic statement of the rogers ramanujan identities yet again. This hypergeometric sum, which was a generating function, equals this quotient of a theta function, well, two theta functions, one of them being Thetakins. And uh, what I wrote on the previous board here are the actual values of the exponents. I'm Highlighting these because they're going to appear again. Actually, I should have put them in blue. This is going to be a theme. At several points, I'm going to put certain numbers in blue or red so that you recognize them a slide or two later. So here's one. Uh, again, this was mentioned uh, by, by Larry, if I recall correctly. So 
uh, Nam's conjecture on the modularity of certain hypergeometric or, or Eulerian forms, which in this particular case was proven by Zagier. So, uh, and yes, A, B, and C should be rational. I didn't put that up. Uh, but anyway, uh, this sort of dimension one or degree one case, if this Eulerian series is modular, actually only for a finite list, seven of them, and here are the two rogers ramanujan cases. They naturally come out of Zagier's asymptotic calculations, and then, as Larry mentioned, to actually see that they are modular requires uh, an, an identity of the sort of rogers ramanujan So I, I mention that to really further emphasize or, or explore in, in a little more depth uh, one of these directions and inspirations that you can draw from the rogers ramanujan identities. So in particular, from this viewpoint of the rarity of modular Eulerian series, it's a, a very special phenomenon that one has an infinite sum equals an infinite product. And among your search on that signet for the rogers ramanujan identities, you'll find a, a bit of a, I shouldn't say cottage industry, because there are a lot of very deep and beautiful results in, in this area. I, I should just say a, a subfield, a meaningful subfield of some product identities and inspired from the, the very first. Or here's another way to state and think about this identity that on the one side, there's a hypergeometric Q series that has something to do with Q difference equations. I'll come back to that uh, a bit later. And it actually turns out to be a modular function or up to a rational Q power. Or, yep, another way of thinking about what this special phenomenon is and, and how it might guide your future searches for kind of equally meaningful or special identities and instances of, of this sort of phenomenon. We have a, a generating function for certain partitions with uh, simple combinatorial conditions ends up giving you some sort of automorphic function. In this case, a modular function. But if I say automorphic function, that opens the door. And, and, and if I use quotes, so uh, I'm not even restricting to that, then, then that allows me to expand my search or, or my openness to things involving mock modular forms or mixed mock modular forms or quantum modular forms, things that are not even, you know, where the theory isn't even fully developed yet, but actually that's maybe the point and maybe the continued relevance of these sorts of identities. So here's one example of a classically inspired, a, a, a classical and old partition identity that has, has continued to bear fruit and uh, be of interest, I hope to con convince you. And this is the example that I'm going to explore the most in depth in this talk. This will be the middle two thirds, say. So we'll start with uh, Schur's combinatorial investigation of, again, certain partition functions with certain gap conditions. And this is maybe slightly more complicated than Rogers or Monogen. So say this first one, B3 of N, these are the partitions where the parts differ by at least three, except they have to differ by more than three if they are multiples of three. Um, I'll put up in an example in a moment, though actually I don't recall if I'm even going to illustrate that restriction. Oh, and, and the second one, again, much like the second rogers ramanujan partition function, same thing, but the smallest part can't be too small. For rogers ramanujan you couldn't have a one. Here you can't have a one, two, or three. And I'll denote, I'll use the generating function several times, so we'll give them this distinguished notation, script B and script C sub three. 
So here are the three sure partitions of nine. All right, and you do see it. Um, so you can't have the partition six plus three because those are multiples of three, so the gap of three can't actually be used. Note the three highlighted in blue. Uh, actually, if you replace the three by a J in these definitions, everywhere there's a three, then you already see several other examples of some of the oldest or simplest partition identities. So uh, actually, you more or less see Euler's uh, distinct identity, or you, you see partitions in the distinct parts, if you interpret being divisible by zero as being satisfied by every positive integer, so that's a little degenerate. But Rogers or Ronigen is legitimately the j equals one case. And there's a, another fairly famous identity that uh, goes back to the 40s and, and then later 60s um, for j equals 2, but I won't really discuss that. But why, so, so you might ask, why is there this condition with the divisibility, and why am I saying, I mean, it's kind of an odd way to think about the Rogers or Monogen identities. Well, actually, there's uh, some fairly simple uh, work of Alder from the 50s that suggests that there aren't any modular identities or, or even infinite product identities if you look at partitions where the gaps are at least j, for any j at least 3, so you need some additional condition unavoidably. And I'll just mention for uh, history and uh, giving credit that this, so some of Alder's work was conjectural, but it's been fully established uh, quite recently. Uh, Claudia's in the room, right? Yeah. So recall this uh, notation for partitions whose parts are lying in distinguished residue classes, plus or minus r mod k. I am not writing them out, but d sub 6, 1 of, of 9, there are three partitions there, again in blue, again not an accident. Schur's partition theorem in combinatorial form says that the Schur partitions b3 of n are always equinumerous with these d sub 6, 1 of n with the residue condition. Here's an analytic statement of this. Well, actually, you'll note I haven't really written down the generating function in any explicit detail, and there's a reason for that. It's a, it's a bit messier, and you can't just kind of immediately write it down with these gap conditions. But I can write down the product uh, in one of two ways. They're kind of equivalent elementarily. Again, they are also expressible in terms of theta functions, which I'll do subsequently. So this is highly analogous to the first rogers ramanujan identity, right? The, generating function for partitions with gap conditions is some sort of modular function, infinite product, theta quotient. There, actually, this is a shorter list than one could write down for Rogers or Monogen, but at least in terms of the combinatorics and the generating functions, there have been quite a number of generalizations of Schur's work. It's been very rich in, in that vein, at least. So due to Andrews, expanding to a k-fold product, not just with two terms. Uh, a very similar, though a bit different result for Andrews and Olson, Olson with two s's, with uh, applications in group theory. Uh, both of those were further refined and further explained combinatorially by Quartil and Jeremy. Uh, there's also an over-partition version of uh, an, an analog that's uh, very akin uh, due to Jeremy and subsequently extended by uh, Gian Duce. So 
again, what, what good is it in recognizing modularity if you have some combinatorial or hypergeometric function? Well, one thing that you can often do, and we've seen several examples of, are asymptotic formulas. So here's a coefficient formula in the spirit of Hardy and Ramanujan. This was first worked out by Niven in 1940. Um, there's no particular point in me writing these other than that I have slides and you might care to you know, look at the numbers. But The proof, uh, again, was you following Rademacher's, um, I guess, perfection or, or completion of the hardy ramanujan circle method which uses, in a fundamental way, the modular transformations. And, uh, you know, of course, this is just the leading term. You actually get an exact series involving Klusterman sums and Bessel functions, much like Scott showed for the partition function. Uh, just for kicks and for comparison, here's that leading term, which Scott did not include. And uh, also, I'm not going to write down this formula, but Lehner did the same thing for the rogers ramanujan functions, which were those level five, essentially, modular, modular functions. But uh, recall that there were two rogers ramanujan identities, and the second one was also modular, just with a, a bit of shift. So what about that second Schur function? Well, it's a little more complicated, but leads you in some new and interesting and, and you know, uh, leads to some more of the modern and recent developments in number theory. So Andrews was actually the, the first to really look at this um, seriously as this analog to the second Rogers or Monogen, and he wrote down this generating function, which at the time um, maybe didn't know so much to do with, but, uh, and uh, he, he had a, a rough idea that this was something like some of the expressions that were known or that you could see for some of Ramanujan's mock theta functions, but uh, of course it's not exactly any of them or expressible, uh, really using them in, in a clean way. So we've already heard a bit about this story. So the Ramanujan's famous mock theta functions, and then the explosion of work in modern years, which we all owe a great uh, debt to Sveger's groundbreaking thesis, and also many others in this room who have fulfilled, uh, f furthered the story, uh, really tied it to the theory of weak harmonic mass forms. So here's a first result that I'll present in this talk, uh, more or less an answer to Andrew's question that this generating function for the second Schur partition theorem is some theta quotient times G3, where G3 is the same universal mock theta function that can be expressed either as an Eulerian sum or perhaps even better with the sort of a, a Pell-Lurch sum that ties more directly to uh, Sveger's uh, systematic development and, and his thesis. So again, in other words, the generating function for the second Schur partition function is some sort of automorphic function, or you might call this a weak mixed mock modular form, a meromorphic product of a modular form and a mock modular form. Uh, right, I thought I'd just say another word or two about some of the history and uh, meaning of the universal mock theta functions. So the, this G3 in, in that form 
was introduced by Hickerson uh, in order to prove and, and really help unify some, at the time, mysterious identities amongst many of Ramanujan's Mach theta functions. And all of them can be expressed in terms of G3. For example, here is one of the simplest relationships. So one of Ramanujan's original Mach theta functions, psi has this shape, and that specializes pretty easily to this uh, G3. So again, once you have an appropriate notion of automorphicity, then one thing that you can often do is asymptotic results. So here's an example of that, a theorem for the Schur partitions. Note that the first function is about three times the second function, which was a conjecture of Andrews and was partially proven by his PhD student Parberry. And oh, I should have mentioned also that first formula um, is the same that I already put up from Nevin, the, the B3. It's the C3 that's the new one. I'm not really going to say too much about the proof of this other than that it's using, uh, again, well, not quite the hardy Ramanujan circle method, but a variant due to right that is a little better suited to some of these mixed mock modular objects. There's a, a little more leniency in how the modular transformations can look, though the trade-off is that one does not get exact formulas this way and does not recover things like uh, what you saw in Scott's talk. So, yeah. I uh, also want to highlight some of the, the combinatorial meaning of this, the the, main, the the first theorem statement, the identity for the second sure partition function. So th this is just reshuffling things around, but it says that this specialization of the universal Mach theta function is the quotient of the two sure partition functions. So somewhat roughly stated, the G3 is somehow representing the difference between these two combinatorial generating functions. It, it's somehow encoding you know, how, how exactly how restrictive the C3 condition is relative to the B3. So how restrictive is it to have the smallest part greater than three or not? That's all a little vague. So let me further convince you that this is a natural and a meaningful and really a quite striking way of writing this result. And I'll ask you to recall or tell you for the first time about Rogers and Ramanujan's very famous continued fraction. So if you recall, the subscript sub one was for the Rogers-Ramanujan partitions. Actually, I never defined script B and script C, but I mean the same thing, the generating functions for the first and the second rogers Ramanujan partitions, respectively. Uh, here are what the products looked like. And on the right-hand side is the very striking part in Ramanujan's very famous continued fraction. And in particular, this says that up to the appropriate rational Q power, and, and this is really what Ramanujan was using and amazing us all with, that this is really just a, a modular function. And so you can conclude some really striking properties of, and unexpected properties of this continued fraction using that. In the case of sure partitions, well, it's not a modular function, and there is not a continued fraction quite of the simplicity, although there is one you can write down. I'm not including it. But again, there is this modularity or automorphicity, quote unquote, of the quotient. 
as a, another way to kind of further tease out and um, specify more what I mean by, you know, it's a neat observation that the universal Mach theta function is this combinatorial ratio. Here's a, another theorem that is a, a consequence or an interpretation or an extension, I suppose, of this result. So I'm not going to write down what this probability space is exactly, though I'll say a couple words about it in a moment. But in fact, if Q is real, then this uh, specialization of the universal Mach theta function is actually some conditional probability for some events. So in particular, the value of G3 is between zero and one. It's a probability. Uh, actually, I don't know how to prove that directly from the hypergeometric representations, though there may be an easy, stupid proof that it lies between zero and one, but I haven't found one, other than thinking about probability. So this is not um, a, and, and the, the motivation for why one might think to plug in real Q and think about probability in this setting is that exactly the same thing happened a few years ago. I should have included some years here. So starting in about 2004, uh, there was a paper of Holroyd, Liggett, and Romick that was uh, about combinatorial probability, uh, about the calculations of metastability thresholds, or you may have heard the term finite size scaling or power laws, these sorts of things, in bootstrap percolation, which is a, a certain combinatorial process that shows up in uh, lots of networks or graphs, uh, uh, sorts of graph theory models. And subsequently, Andrews described how actually some of what the combinatorics of what they were doing uh, were actually interpreted as Fourier series rather than probabilities were actually mixed mock modular forms. And so then uh, I subsequently um, did some work on this a couple of papers now, four or five years ago. Anyway, uh, this is not unrelated to this fact about the universal Mach theta function G3. Um, these probability events are similarly corresponding to some sort of finite Markov process um, with some sort of limiting behavior, and that, that's what the W and X are, are roughly doing, that G3 can be realized as a generating function or, if you like, a limit calculation for certain probabilities. And uh, to wrap up uh, my discussion of the Schur partitions, uh, there's some work in progress. You'll, you'll notice that all of these results have G3 specialized to this negative Q colon Q cubed. It's been the case on all these pages. Well, I won't back up all the way. But the universal Mach theta function is defined with two parameters. You know, it's essentially some sort of Jacobi object. I mean, it has Jacobi transformations. You need to correct them to you know, make them quite right. But the X and Q are, are really both there as parameters. And actually, almost all the results that I've presented, um, there are versions for the unspecialized mixed mock modular form, that G3 of XQ will turn out to be a combinatorial correction factor, a quotient of two partition functions, will have some sort of probability models, will have this sort of mixed mock modularity, where instead of the sure partitions, it'll be some three colored version, which is an idea that traces back to uh, Alati and Gordon's work from the 90s, um, some analytic proofs and extensions that they gave of the sure partitions. <laughs> 
And there's, as part of this, there is a, an infinite family of related identities. It's not just the base Q cubed and partitions modulo three or six or so on, but for any base, there's a related sure result. Oh, okay. I did include a few proof ideas. Um, forgotten about that. Well, uh, maybe a page or two, I think it is. So just quickly, what is underlying some of, some of this? Uh, one of the important ideas is to refine the generating function, and then that brings us into the world of Q difference equations, where hypergeometric Q series are essentially the natural solutions, or the only solutions, or a give a basis of solutions. And one achieves this by counting something additional, uh, in this case, counting the parts. And it leads to, say, this sort of Q difference equation that, that Andrews first wrote down for the first of the sure partition functions. And uh, if one knows a bit about solving such Q difference equations uh, using hypergeometric Q series and modular forms and theta functions and these sorts of relations, it leads more or less to, to these results. Uh, amplified with a, a healthy dose of some of the transformation theory of hypergeometric basic hypergeometric Q series. And uh, as I already mentioned, the asymptotic results use various versions of the circle method, uh, amplified with asymptotic expansions using the modular transformations, or if you like, and the more or less equivalent perspective is using the Mellon transform. Okay, so that ends my discussion of the sure partitions. So I'll close with, for 10 or 15 minutes by talking about another family of identities that are not quite as old, but are also fairly simple combinatorially and have natural connections to modular functions and whose applications in many directions have been explored but whose number theoretic interest and importance has remained relatively untouched and is actually very fertile um, and leads to some interesting, again, quote unquote, automorphic behavior. So Caparelli, beginning with his PhD thesis, uh, un undertook, he was more or less following Lepowski Wilson's vertex operator algebra, algebra program, which they developed for finding the standard modules of various affine Lie algebras. And one of the, the first observations is that, yes, this is a, another place where the Rogers or Monogen identities raise their heads. So as I described there from a 2-2. Two -two. And Caparelli's new, tr truly new results uh, led him to some, at the time, conjectural partition identities when he tried to calculate the level three standard modules of the same algebra. And so in particular, th this already gives you, it, it's at, at the very outset, here's an application and a motivation for caring about this partition identity that Actually, you need the partition identity to verify that the construction using the roots and playing around with the uh, various highest weight parts of, of the module are actually correct and actually give you the, the full basis. Um, the partition identities are, are essential to complete the proof of the algebraic results. Six and the condition should be a three. 
and I'll denote the counting functions for these partitions by little c of n. Oh, and I'll also, again, just like we saw with Rogers or Monogen and the sure, interesting things happen if you maybe restrict the smallest part and don't allow ones or twos or threes or such things. And here's a, another definition of partitions in the parts with just residue restrictions with congruences. So here the parts are not plus or minus j mod six. Here are two examples. So the Caporelli level three partitions where the smallest part is at least two. Well, there are three of them. The partitions whose parts of, of 10 whose parts are not plus or minus one mod six are these, also three of them. Again, both the threes are blue. I'm trying to tell you something. And indeed, this is the theorem. Uh, this was Caporelli's conjecture, but it was subsequently proven by Andrews, independently by, well, Caporelli himself, uh, the latest, and also by Tomba and Z, um, also algebraists. And there's a, a second one which is a little different flavor from Rogers or Monogen and Schur. So this C1 minus C2 plus C3 also equals one of these clean congruential restriction identities. Uh, actually, if you think about it, just uh, elementary inclusion exclusion, that second one is counting partitions that have no two. So a one and a three is okay, but no twos. And again, uh, this is not an isolated identity. There's a family where the modulus three can, uh, just as I mentioned at the end of my discussion of the sure identities, the modulus three can be increased to any J, where actually for small J, you might prefer, you might need to think in terms of colored parts. Uh, this is found in a refinement of Alati, Andrews, and Gordon, and also from an algebraic perspective, uh, constructing these standard modules and work of Merman and Print. I'm not gonna state that general shape. Uh, again, I'll write down the modular, or if you like, analytic version, denoting the generating function. So again, a script C sub two, and for the other one, I'm just for shorthand, I'll write it script C sub two star, where the star means no twos now, rather than at least two. So here's just a restatement with the theta quotients showing that these are modular functions. And here is uh, another new result. So, those two previous results were for the C2 and C2 star, but kind of the, the lowest of the Capra. Oh, and, and what I mean by script C1 is just for the little C1, the, all the, the smallest part is at least one. And that's expressible in terms of, well, the script C2 and C2 star, which were modular, some other modular stuff out front, again, a modular function. Uh, but then these sort of shifted partial theta functions, the capital theta one and theta two, so which we've already seen theta functions, modular functions, mock theta functions, and now false theta functions falling out from some fairly simple and early examples of partition identities. We'll say a few more words about false state of functions and why we care about them and why they are you know, perhaps also included in my banner of quote unquote automorphic. Oh, first, so just uh, expanding it out, here's what the theta one looks like if you don't care to think about the character. 
Yeah, so why do we care about something like this, which is some sort of partial false theta function? Actually, neither of those terms are consistently used in the literature, so I don't feel bad about further muddying the waters. But one certainly sees things like this, half lattice sums and incorrectly alternating signs or shifted characters and so on. Uh, that is something that often comes out when one studies quantum modular forms. There are examples uh, of a very similar shape. Uh, again, some of the names of some of the people who have done recent work on quantum modular forms, whose, as Larry described, uh, theory is very much still being built and developed. So I'll close with uh, just a word or two about some of the proof ideas for these new Caporelli identities. And I think the main thing I want to highlight well, so again, um, one can use the partition combinatorics and generating functions to set up a certain Q difference equation, though one additional feature now is that it's non-homogeneous in the sense that one of these terms does not include the function, but there are techniques to do this. And, uh, well, Larry, mentioned, and I thought maybe I would actually expound and put in uh, a little more explicitly that when working with some of these Eulerian forms or hypergeometric series, there are just certain identities that lead theta functions or different shapes or, to pop out. So here is one sort of identity where there's a hypergeometric series on the left, and among other things, these sorts of partial theta functions on the right. And uh, actually, that first term on the right from Ramanujan's identity, uh, in many cases, further specializes due to a, an identity of Rogers, and again, is some sort of false theta function where the signs are not really right. So just to give a brief flavor at what, uh, I mean, these are maybe some of the simpler hypergeometric identities that you would use uh, as tools in this area. But, and, oh, that was it. Well, thank you. <laughs>